the, the primary reason is I really want people to understand the process behind the work that I'm creating. Uh, if I write things directly in machine code, um, or in a higher, higher level programming language, then it becomes only a few select people can actually read the, the rules or, or the process that, that goes behind the work. And so I've started working in this way. And so if you read this, you can see it introduces something which is an element. So let me show you this. The software that uh, is associated with this is what we've been looking at uh, at the beginning of the talk. And this, for example, is another instance of that software. And so I work in a way where I have this, this core process, this core set of um, ways of relating a piece of geometry to, to other pieces of geometry in time with behaviors. And then I use that to generate a number of different things, including software, um, also including printed images. So this is a print based on that same process. This is a high resolution, or basically just an enlargement of that same print, so you can see the resolution. Um, I find that working exclusively in software can be extremely limiting, um, primarily for reasons of resolution, both resolution in time um, and resolution sort of in density and space. So once again, here we have the, the process. And here is a, a diagram or a list of what element one is. So you can see that element one, which is referred to as the pro in the process, is form one plus behaviors one through three. So form one is simply a circle, behavior one, constant linear motion, behavior two, constraint to surface, behavior three, when touching another, change direction, and behavior four, when touching another, move away from its center. So I'm showing you this, it's kind of, it's looking under the hood, it's showing something really behind the images we were looking at, but I also want to show you what it looks like in terms of software. And so what we're going to look at now is simply form one plus behavior one, so the circle with constant linear motion. And the way to read the diagram is that this black dot, as you can see, is just showing the direction the circle is moving in. So I'll speed that up. If you look at behavior two, which is constrained to surface, you can see that when they hit the edge, they are, they're then stopped. If you look at behavior three, and all these behaviors are compounding, basically this one's when touching another change of direction. So you can see what that looks like. Now with behavior four, when touching another, move away from its center. You can see how taking these really simple rules and just adding them together um, over time can create a, a motion which is deceptively complicated. So one thing to do about this is just to increase the number of elements in the space. Now this is really sort of behind the hood here. And I just increase it from 12 to 120 and then run the program. You can see now that this, this form or this surface that's created um, looks, looks far more than the sum of those simple behaviors, those simple rules. So this is the system that I've set up for myself. Um, and it's really my own way of programming rather than simply relying on a programming language that's given to me, for example, like C++ or Java. And so I have the forms and behaviors which make up elements, which then comprise processes, which then result in these um, different manifestations across different media. Um, so one thing that's always been a question for me is what's the best way to represent these processes? And so one way that I do it is through diagrams. And so what we're looking at now is sort of is one step in time, one frame of that process. And here you can see it as a diagram at the top. Basically when they're touching, you can see the connected by the lines. And then down here is the data view. And so basically what we're looking at is the same thing. These are the numbers which generate this diagram for one frame of the process. So for example, the top number here is its I the ID number of each individual circle. And then we have, for example, its, its X coordinate, its Y coordinate, its size, its um, rotation, and its number of connections, number of neighbors that it's touching. Here's another way to represent that same process. And this is the um, hexadecimal notation. So it's the binary code um, of that piece of software. So it's a different way of looking at the same thing. Um, theoretically, 
uh, if you would type this in and not make any mistakes, this 32-page book of hexadecimal notation, named it .exe, and ran it on a Pentium family processor, then you would get that same image that we were looking at when we first started the lecture. And yet here's one more way of looking at this piece of um, this process. And this is looking at the code and looking at the order in which code is run. When a piece of software runs, it doesn't run from top to bottom. It actually jumps around a lot, and oftentimes the same piece of code is run many times. And this visualization is showing that. Where here you can see the lines of code, and then what this diagram is showing is which lines of code are run in which sequence. And you can also see, for example, when you have this uh, area of high density, that that line of code is running many times. That's in this software, it's called a for structure, and it just means that it's executing this, executing this piece of code, um, for example, about 120 times uh, before moving on to the next section. And so the diagram that we're looking at here is two frames of the animation. And then this is another way of looking at it. This is how I, this is how I installed things at this time. And here we see the text-based uh, process, the instructions. Here we see the software running. And at this point in time, I thought it was really interesting to uh, really expose the hardware to make this um, juxtaposition between the, the software, the brain, and the hardware, the body, and basically just showing that the two are complementary. They need each other um, to, to work. And then here is more the, the diagramming version, the data view of the process at an individual frame. And then, of course, this work um, has other lives, too. So this is an example of a performance uh, that I gave in Austria in 2003, and it's Steve Reich's Music for 18 Musicians, where here's the orchestra um, playing the music, and then I was a little off stage over to the left um, doing live visuals uh, during, while the music was playing. And so I modified the software to be a drawing-based piece of software, and then basically created a visual score for myself uh, that each passage of the piece would have a different, different graphic or form language, and then I basically animated um, the entire composition through drawing. Okay, so we need multiple instances in order to see what's ha happening. And so here's process six. So I'll paraphrase this so you don't, don't need to read it. I also want to hide this because I don't want you to focus on that. So process six uses the same element that we were looking at before element one. Whoa. But process six works a little bit differently. It adds a further constraint. Oh. Okay, so process six adds a further constraint. And that's that um, the origin at which these circles uh, come from is, is pre-assigned. And you can see there's three origin points. And they have this basic rule that they, they leave their origin point, and then when they reach the, the, um, the edge of the circle that they're inscribed within, they then return back to the center point. So if we look at the diagram of this one, basically what it's doing each frame, you can here see what's actually happening underneath. So in a way, this is the machine that generates that surface. And it's following these same simple rules that were outlined at the beginning of the talk. And then so once again, from this process, I generate a series of static images. And so here, each one of these quadrants is the software run for 600 frames and then stopped, but each one has a different uh, starting seed. So here you can see a detail of that. So it starts to show um, a, a range of the possible forms that can be generated from the same process, um, just give it a, a different initial condition. And here's one more version of that. So this is process six, image four. And in this one, um, they're all just growing from their center and uh, not interacting with, with their neighbors, with, with the ones that are in their close proximity. And here's an enlargement of that. And the color that's applied here, whoops, the color that's applied 
is um, based on the distance of each of the elements to one another. So if the distance is very short, um, meaning two small circles are touching, you get a different uh, color value than if two larger circles, two large elements are touching. And so that's why you have this gradient moving through the, the image. And so of course this work also uh, can be applied to different contexts. Uh, this is a gallery opening at the Bank Gallery, which is over in the Bank District downtown, very nearby, uh, from fall 2005. And this was actually the first time that I brought this work more into a space and took into account sort of a, a room-sized uh, installation rather than simply a rectangular surface. And in this installation, you have these um, 18 different disks on the ground. Um, each one has an image um, which is growing on top of its surface. And so it's not a, not a static thing, but it's actually, they're, they're growing in the way that we saw it growing a few minutes ago. That's more of the true color of the piece. Okay, so to show you um, a different element and how it can, how can it generate different type of form language, um, here we have element two. So element two is once again form one a circle, but here it's actually even simpler. So we have a constant linear motion, and then after moving off the surface, enter from the opposing edge. So let's look at that. And in this instance, you can see that the line is, is just showing you the exact angle. A very, very simple system. They're not aware of each other in any way. And then so process eight then uh, explains how to make a surface from that simple system where it says when two circles intersect at the two points of intersection, simply draw a new circle at that point. So let's look at process eight. Okay, moving on. And then here, for example, is what the software looks like. And then these are two different images of prints that were based on process eight. So this is one group. These were shown for the first time last December at a show that I had in Seoul. And this is another group. And once again, these images, actually I didn't mention it before, they're, they're medium format. They're about a yard by a yard. Okay, so one more to show, and then I'm going to open it up and talk about something far more general. So element four, I just wanted to show this one because it, um, it has a different basic primitive, and here the primitive is a line. And so here the basic rules are, um, when you move off the surface, move back on at the opposite edge that you came off of, and then you can see here, when you're overlapping with another, uh, change your direction. And when they're touching, there's this, that dot appears just so that you can actually see that, that the, the software is registering that the touch is happening. So once again, a very simple system, but some of the surfaces that are generated by it um, are the opposite. So for example, in this one, it's simply uh, drawing a dot at the um, leading edge of each line when it's touching another. And there's a slight um, nuance to it where when it's first touching another one, um, the color is white by default and it, it moves as a gradient towards black. And then when it stops touching, the gradient moves back towards white. So that's why you can see the, um, the intersections happening in white and why it's not just starting and stopping black and white. But one reason that I like to work in this way is that it leaves a, basically stopping at um, English as, as the level at which I'm putting the emphasis on the program gives me a lot of room for flexibility and ambiguity. 
in my view, one of the biggest frustrations in working with software is that you have to specify things at such an extreme level of detail. While, as I said, I've only been working with software for about six years, uh, prior to that, I was working with media that was very flexible and very malleable. There was a really tight feed feedback loop between making a decision, making a mark, and then perceiving that back with my body. With software, there's an extra step between where you have to imagine something um, and then you have to inscribe it in a, a notation which is very um, numerical before you can see, it, see actually what you were imagining. And so there's w sort of a one step removal. And um, I started working in this way as, as a way of, of beginning to get around that. So what we're looking at in this piece of software as opposed to the last one, and then I'll show one more. All right, when this process is um, described, it says basically, um, change your direction when touching another. So that's the, that's the largest point of ambiguity in this piece of software. And so then um, I, have, I need to make the decision, um, how much of the direction do I, do I change when it's actually touching another line? And so what we've seen in these last three examples are different interpretations of, of what that means, either of just um, moving slightly, or in this one is the extreme where it's actually turning a great deal. And so there's this, um, range of possible forms that can be generated from this, this single process. And for me, something that's even more interesting is the fact that other people can interpret these processes in different ways. Um, and the results can be even more different from what I'm showing you now, but it still sort of satisfies um, the, the, the process itself. So it's just bringing this ambiguity, bringing more of a, an arbitrariness and a sort of room for human interpretation into the software process. Um, that notion is what led me to start working in this, this methodical way with English as the, as the primary programming language. And these are a few different uh, examples of iteration um, using that um, piece of software as the, as the generator, as, as the base for producing form. Okay, so that's the end of that portion of the talk. And I'm going to talk now about uh, processing.org. So these are just a, link, a list of uh, references. Um, where I teach now is the Design Media Arts Department at UCLA. And processing.org I've been working on for the last six years with Ben Fry. We have our six-year anniversary this June, actually. It's been an amazing project. Um, it's taken about three or four years of my life away um, that weren't expected. Um, but that's been really healthy. And um, it's, it's gone in directions that we hadn't originally planned it to go. So let me bring that up. Okay. So processing. Um, it's a programming language for teaching, sketching, and prototyping. Uh, this is what it looks like. We were looking at it a little bit before, um, but here you can see, see the full thing. Basically, it's a programming environment. Let me go here to the actual thing. Where you type in, for example, some code. Like here, I'll draw a program for drawing a line. So I'll say line 10, 20, 80, 90. And then I'll run the program. You can see it opens a new window and then it draws the line according to these coordinates. So this is the xy of the first point and the xy of the second point with the coordinate system starting in the upper left. And so you can see the difference between, for example, working in a CAD-based program where you actually draw things with a mouse or some other input device and doing things in this way where everything is done um, through a function using the exact coordinates. If I want to make something that moves, I just add a little bit to the program. So I'll make a void setup and a void draw. So these are basically special functions for the language. Um, when the program runs, the code in setup runs once. So I'll make a window which is 200 by 200 pixels. And then I'll run the code. And then here, I can replace the xy coordinate simply with the mouse X and the mouse Y. So this is the coordinate where the cursor currently is. And now you can see the line follows where I move the cursor. And so this is a really simple program written in processing. 
And we designed the language in such a way where people could begin getting results within using it for 10 minutes or a half hour. They could start making things. Um, but then where the sort of level of complexity scales to a, a very um, high ceiling, which is basically the Java language itself. And so you can keep adding complexity um, until you're, you're writing programs which hopefully satisfy your, your goals and desires. Let me show you just a couple examples, short demos. This one's quite silly, but I like it. It's called Alphabot, and it's simply just, um, it shows that the language is full 3D. And for example, if I hit Z, you can see it transform into the letter Z or an M. And from here, I think with more within your context, you can do a number of different things with it. For example, you can export it as a DXF file, and then that way you can render it in a, in a program that has better rendering capability. Um, see, I'll show one more. There's a piece called Yellowtail by Golan Levin, and it's basically an, an animation program where you're thinking about drawing an animation in a different way than a traditional way. Mm -hmm. So here I make a gesture with my finger, and then when I release the, the cursor, that gesture continues. So if I make a really quick line, we get this result. If I make a really slow line, I get this result. So for me, the reason to write software, to sort of to invest the time and effort in that, or learning how to do that, is because it allows you to um, basically build things with the computer where there's a direct engagement between, um, between the two systems. And so also in processing, you can see there's not a lot of interface around it. So as opposed to the flash environment, for example, where you have um, a timeline, you have sort of a, a, a library of symbols, here you, just, you have the code in front of you. And we did that primarily for, for two reasons. One, because that's how a lot of people pref prefer to work. And that also, as sort of an introduction to programming, we feel it's really sound pedagogically because you, um, you basically, you're focusing on the relationship between this code and the image which results from the, the code. And then as people become more familiar with it, more comfortable with it, you can always expand and start using different environments with, which give you um, other higher level tools. Okay, so this is just a really brief um, history of the project. It originated from a project called Design by Numbers, which was written by Professor John Maeda, and then also a project called ACU, which is what we used within our research group um, to, to do the work we were doing. So Design by Numbers looked like this. Um, you can see it has the same interface, and here you would type lines of code, and then you see the results here. Design by Numbers was wonderful because it allowed people who were visually motivated, people who didn't want to go through or didn't get through a computer science programming class to be able to grasp these core concepts. These core concepts of software aren't unique to um, the sciences or the engineering disciplines. They're actually concepts that we as architects, as designers, as artists work with all the time. But um, it's just uh, put in a different context within computer science. And we felt that we needed a shift in context more to the visual space in order to introduce these, these, um, these low-level uh, software concepts to this audience. The problem with design by numbers, though, was that you were constrained to 100 by 100 pixels in grayscale. And so with processing, we tried to keep some of the simplicity of design by numbers, but to really expand the potential of what it could do. These are a few of the design considerations in designing the language. We needed to have a, ba a lot of balances between, for example, the speed of C++ with the simplicity of a scripting language like Python. Um, we needed it to also be really relevant. And so the idea that the syntax that we use in processing is really relevant to a lot of different programming languages that you might use later on in your career. For example, you might move up to C++, or I would actually qualify this as you move over to ActionScript. Um, or to other scripting languages. I know that a lot of the language, or a lot of the environments being built for architecture and generative architecture rely on scripting languages and a lot on JavaScript and Python. And the syntax is very similar, uh, JavaScript to processing, so it makes it relevant as a, as a teaching language for, for that kind of uh, shift or environment. So these are some of the different things it can do. I think some of the things that are most relevant to you are the rendering in 3D and the OpenGL acceleration. So that's what allows you to go full screen 
um, and to develop these uh, dimensional forms. In terms of um, exporting, you can export to the web, so you can just simply, like for example here, um, if I hit this button, it simply just exports it to a web format, so I can just post it on a website and then display it that way. Um, but you can also export applications as well, so you can run full screen. Um, and it's, this is something that's really important for us, that it's available on these diff three different operating systems to allow it to reach the maximum audience. Um, other exporting capability include, ex as I said before, exporting DDXF. And then you can also interface with um, hardware and electronics um, devices. And then also it's really easy to bring in input, for example, from a video camera. And then the way the project has really expanded through the open source uh, software community has been through writing these extensions, ways of expanding it beyond um, what it is, was originally built to do. Here's some examples of some of the libraries that have been built. For example, for video networking, for ex importing and exporting different data formats. Um, I'm really excited that it's expanding in this way. And I actually think this might be the most relevant um, use for, for this group. And that's in um, using a related project to processing. One's called wiring, the other's called Arduino. Has anybody heard of Arduino project? One, okay. So that's good, I'm glad I get to introduce it to you. Um, it's basically a hardware board which allows you to um, hook up sensors and to control motors um, through basically programming to this microcontroller here. And it uses a programming environment and a programming language which is almost identical to processing. I have a few boards with me if people are curious about doing that, um, about, about looking into it. Um, but essentially, for example, if you want to um, sense the light level in a room or you want to detect the temperature or you want to um, know if somebody is present, somebody's there. Um, it's that kind of, um, this kind of sensor that you can interface through the Arduino board and then bring into some larger structure that you're building. The reason this platform is good is because it's very inexpensive. It's about $30 per board um, and you can connect a lot of different um, sensors to it and control a lot of motors with it as well. It's a very flexible, very inexpensive, open source way of um, basically actuating on the world and bringing input into your programs. And then also we have Processing Mobile, which is a version of the software which runs um, on mobile phones. Okay, so this idea of open source in the libraries, this is really how the project goes, or grows. Um, so I'm gonna show you now the story of, of one of these libraries and its creation. Here, for example, you can get a range of the different things that you have available to you. As I said before, a lot of data in out, um, a lot of uh, bringing in alternative inputs like video camera, libraries for doing some basic physics or um, simulation, and there's a lot of libraries for doing sound and computer vision. So this program that I'm showing now, in a moment when it starts up, this was written by one of my undergraduate students at UCLA. And the basic program here is that you make a gesture, and then that gesture is translated into an object. So for example here, if I cross the stream, you can see that it creates something which is more plant-like. Um, if, I, if I go really slowly, it creates um, that type. If I go quickly, it makes these small ones. But essentially, to build this piece of software, um, this student needed to go beyond what, this, what the program could do. For me, that's the most important um, Mm. component of open source software for architects and artists are that it allows you to simply expand what your software is doing. Um, oftentimes what you want to do if you're working towards being an expert or um, you want to do something specific and you want to go beyond what the, what the proprietary, what the commercial software would like to do. And open source software often allows you to extend it to do something more specialized, more custom. So in this program he needed to be able to load these SVG files which are vector graphics. Um, because the current software wasn't able to do that. And that really allowed him to open up his form language or create a different kind of image than simply by specifying everything through coordinate points. So that then evolved into what now is the SVG library, which allows you to load in um, many different uh, vector-based graphics. And so the next topic is sketch versus final. And this is something that we, we built into the processing language. It's the ability to um, work ideas out in code so that you are working in a 
medium, which is more similar to the final result. So for example, this project is called the Kronos Projector, and it was shown at SIGGRAPH, I think about two years ago. And the idea is you see this cube, it's basically a video cube, where you can imagine frames of video going back um, into the past, and they have this interface, which is a fat piece of fabric, and as you press into the fabric, you're actually moving back into the video space, back into the frames. So here's an applet which um, shows this working. So for example, when I click, you can see moving back into, I think this was, was sunset. So it's moving from the present back into the sunset, back in time. And so this project was being built and processing, allowed it to um, basically put this applet online on the web so that other people could get a better sense, um, better than just a movie, of what this project was doing. And then in the end, it was actually implemented in C++ because they needed a lot of raw speed, raw processing power. Um, here are a few examples of exhibition design installations by a company in Germany called Artcom, Art Plus Com. And they do a lot of sketching and processing um, before doing their final exhibitions. Here's a piece called Grass, which was an important project for this particular piece of software because it really stretched its limits. So here you can see an installation diagram, the number of projectors running. And it was actually done as a part of an installation for um, advertising a, an automobile. But here in, you can see a video. And so basically, in this, in this piece, in this project, you had processing um, running this, this image display in the back, and then there was a camera hooked up where you can see that the movements of this person is being tracked, and it's using to influence the, the way the grass is moving. So to mock up something like this, to do like a test or a proof of concept or a prototype in processing, would take about a day and a half. But to get it to the point where you're actually at this, this level of perfection, this level of, of um, um, refinement in the exhibition, then is like another few months of work. But this is what I mean by uh, taking a sketch, being able to sketch quickly to realize your ideas, to build a prototype, and then work in the environment to refine them to, to a different level. So here's a different, uh, different use of the tool used for more rendering-based video. And so this is a uh, REM music video where processing is used to generate this uh, animation on top of the Michael Stipe. So here this uh, star field that you see sort of superimposed on top of him was generated using the processing programming language. And then this was done by a company called Motion Theory in Venice and then it was superimposed um, back onto the, the video frame. So what you can see here is the actual software running. This was, a, for example, what I mean by a sketch, a small test. And as I move the mouse through the space, you can see the star field react to it. And the way the video was made was by actually um, taking in these images of, of his body and rotoscoping it to be black and white, and then loading each frame in, um, image by image, and then letting the software run on top of that, and then later um, doing the composite in After Effects to produce the final image. Here's a similar example, also from motion theory, where processing was used to create this uh, graphics for this Nike advertisement. So here, the, the graphics are really essential to the, the concept of the ad, whereas the idea is it's visualizing the thought processes of the, of the engineer. So I show these examples just to show you that it's possible to do something rendered and, and more polished um, than the software running live. Here's a, once again showing the sketch, showing the software that led to that. Um, I can then, in this environment that the, the group built who, who wrote the software, you can basically turn on and off these different elements. And then after working with this tool, they basically narrowed down which components to use and which part and then did the final rendering. So in terms of input and output, um, writing things out as PDF and SVG are really useful for people doing flat graphics. Um, writing out for DXF is probably more useful for you. Um, for example, using it for either doing rendering or for doing some sort of um, other 3D printing. 
I'm going to skip this one. Um, this is an example of a PDF output that was used for printed graphics. Um, this is a project that Ben Fry, who's my partner working in processing, um, did over time. And this actually shows the sketching process as well. This is a map of, of web logs where you can see basically the top 50. And the top ones are at the left. And we're sort of progressing down this way. And this diagram shows the relations between them. And basically what it shows is there's a lot of interlinking among the top 10. And there's a lot of linking from the bottom up to the top, but not a lot of linking the other way. And so what I'm going to show you now is a series of um, software sketches that worked up to that point. For example, this was the first piece of software that he wrote. And it's pretty much useless. I mean, it's, it's ugly visually. Um, it doesn't communicate anything about the structure. Um, but it was the starting point. So next, he starts to bring some more structure and refinement to the piece. And here we're getting close to the final. And then there's the final image. Here's some more examples of um, high resolution print export. So this was done for the um, Sunday Times magazine with this type in 3D uh, being rendered and then export as vector files so it can be used for print design. These are some different variations. And then also, processing is really good at doing data visualization. Um, there's a lot of custom functions that are used for parsing data, for loading data in different kinds of formats and sources. And then because this programming language is specifically built for making visuals, a lot of different ways that you can um, then show them. This is a piece by one of my, my graduate students, uh, Aaron Coblin, and this piece is called Flight Patterns. And it is um, visualizing the flight data over the United States for one day. And this, this isn't from timetables, this is the actual data for that day. And you can see, for example, the number of planes on the left and then the, the time frame on the right. And what this piece does, it allows you to see the patterns. Um, basically, first thing at dawn, you see an explosion on the East Coast. And gradually, as the time shifts, you can start to see activity on the west and then later in Hawaii. And another thing interesting, I think, about this diagram is that there's no map of the United States here at all. It's simply just implied by the fact that the transportation hubs, um, yeah, where the transportation hubs are. So he did a lot of different visualization studies in getting to that final, final result. So here you can see he was studying with actually the map underneath, but then later found it wasn't useful, or it didn't need to be there. So I'm moving forward. Here, each type of plane is color-coded. I'm going to jump forward. Here he's starting to show the trails, so allowing the plane to show a little bit of where it's coming from. That allows you to see its vector. Here, he's just uh, keeping the trails on continually rather than shortening them. And so the image just keeps accumulating on itself. Then here, he's playing with uh, volume and massing. Okay, that's the end. Thank you very much. So it wasn't a very coherent talk because I kind of switched directions halfway through, but I really wanted you to be able to see both of these, uh, both of these directions. Um, okay. Thanks.